So that there is showing me the voltage drop across this diode. Hey folks, welcome back to the show. For those of you that are new, my name is Luke, and today we're gonna to be going over all of the different test settings on your Fluke 107. Just a couple notes that I have for all of those that are going to be doing electrical uh, testing in a professional capacity, whether that's through the trades or engineering, an entry level model like this 107 is great because you may not know exactly all the different bells and whistles that you're gonna need for your specific industry. Another thing that I wanna to touch on is that as good of a company as Fluke is, their multimeter leads themselves leave something to be desired. So I'll be switching out the leads that come with the unit with a set of silicone leads. If that's something that you're interested in, I'll have a link to those in the description. With all that being said, let's go ahead and get into it. For those of you wondering, this is uh, magnetic, and this is so you can hang your meter off uh, electrical boxes and whatnot. Not a fan of this design. And then these are the leads that are gonna come with like basically every fluke meter. And I just wanted to demonstrate how cumbersome leads like this can be to work with. I mean, you see how stiff and knotted up and unorganized they are. Like you're already gonna be working in a wired mess. You don't need your meter leads to contribute to that mess. So I just take the leads that they have um, and you can either save them as emergency backup or you can just put them in the trash. Silicone like leads like this are going to be much easier to deal with when you're doing your measurements. Um, and then some people always ask, I think on these fluke ones, it's, it's pretty obvious, but you'll see my exposed tips during the show and your leads will come like that. They're just caps. Keep the caps though, because they're part of the cap rating for the meter and leads. So if you're working in higher voltage areas, they'll be handy to have. And then there is no kickstand on this one. Make, always make sure your leads are fully seated. I do like that dial. It's letting us know that it's in auto range. There's a backlight. Backlight's pretty weak. However, with that being said, their LCD displays are really strong and really clear. All right, let's go ahead and get into it. Volt AC. Now, if you're checking an outlet or seeing if something's alive or dead, you know, obviously with the AC polarity is not critical. So you can have your red to hot or neutral or black to hot or neutral. It is best practice to have your red to the hot, but if you're using your meter, you may not know who's who and that's what you're trying to sort out. So it shouldn't affect your actual measurement at all. Let's go ahead and check out this outlet. Now, if you are gonna be checking out things like just a standard little outlet, I would always recommend something like a little outlet tester. Uh, Fluke has one, a bunch of different companies make them. They're very inexpensive. It'll tell you if the wiring's correct, and this one even displays the voltage. But if all you have is your meter and you're trying to figure out an outlet and whether or not it's wired correctly, and you don't wanna pull it out of the wall and all that nonsense, um, let's just go over, go over that procedure really quick. So. We can use our leads to open the doors and we can see, okay, we've got 120 volts AC. Then if I'm trying to figure out what's my hot and what's my neutral, that's where a ground terminal is going to really come into play. Now, luckily this outlet has a ground terminal built into it, but that might not be the case. And you might have to find a ground somewhere in the house and run a ground wire to where you're testing to help you out with this. But what we can do is, you know what, we'll even simulate that scenario this time. We're gonna simulate, this is my ground, a uh, little lug that I have brought over. And now I can just use my other lead to poke around and figure out who's who. So very little difference of potential here, about 80 to 100 millivolts. What about in here? Oh, there's a problem we need. 
Uh, both leads to open the doors. Use the black lead to open that door. This lead to ground. And now we can see, okay, we have 120 volts difference in potential from this to ground. So this must be our hot. And then if you wanted to get extra fancy, we'll sneak over. I do like this dial feels really solid. We'll just sneak over to continuity real quick. And we'll just go ahead and confirm that we have continuity to ground. This meter feels really great. I, <laughs> I deal with a lot of really cheap meters on the show. It's nice to have a professional level meter um, here for doing these tests. All right, volts DC. We're just gonna use this little lithium ion phosphate battery that I have here on the bench um, because you'll probably be using the volts DC for checking batteries. And what does that kind of look like? I often get a lot of questions about checking a car battery with a multimeter. There are some tests that can be done. I'm starting a whole new series and project with a battery testing lab, and we're gonna get way more into depth into that in the coming weeks. Um, but for now, I'll just show you, these are just static checks. And what we're doing here is we're just testing to see state of charge. With batteries, there's gonna be two variables that are really critical. It's gonna be state of charge and state of health. Think of it as like a cup of water. Your state of charge can mean that the cup of water is either full or half empty. The state of health is how big of a cup of water that you need. And if you have a car battery, you need a really big cup of water because it's gonna to have to provide a lot of cranking amps, right? To turn that engine over. And when we're making like a static little measurement like this, we're not really able to see the amps that the battery is capable of delivering. So we can use like battery analyzers, uh, we can check the internal resistance of the battery and do a myriad of other tests. But if we're just doing a simple volts DC test with the battery like this, this is going to just check state of charge. And if it's below a certain state of charge, like let's say if it's a lead acid battery and I was measuring at like 12.1, 12 that would indicate, okay, my, my state of charge is low. Let me try and charge it, bring that voltage up to ideally like the 12.5 or 12.6 I would like to see. And then I can retest my battery and reload test it. But we're gonna get a lot more into batteries later down the road, so don't you worry. If you do it backwards, what does it look like? You'll notice a negative sign here. And that's just letting you know that the polarity of what you're trying to measure is backwards from what the, the meter is anticipating. There is such a thing as negative voltage and stuff. That's not what we're really focused on here. We're just trying to let you know if you see a negative sign, your leads are just backwards and red to positive, black to negative. They do this because on the old analog meters, you know, it was a needle that just pivoted back and forth and it would have just pegged to zero volts if you had your leads backwards. The advantage of a digital meter is that even though that we have our leads backwards, it's saying, hey, there's still voltage here. There's a difference in potential. It's just the other way around. Let's go over millivolts. So millivolts here, you'll see a squiggly line above the millivolt signal. That is telling you that this is only rated for AC millivolts. That can be something really uh, great for like industrial electrical. But the only example that I really have is a speaker and a microphone are basically the same thing. And so what we can do is we can take a speaker and instead of it producing a sound, we can be the pressure waves and input a sound to the speaker. And that's going to output a AC millivolt signal. And, and we can look at that here. You can see as I, uh, as I hit the speaker, our measurement jumps up. For industrial electrical though, you're gonna be looking for like a four to 20 millivolt AC signal. That's what this setting is here for. Ohms, diodes, and continuity. It's going to default to ohms. And let's just take it for a little spin, see how it's looking. 69 ohms, okay, let's start moving up. You're gonna to wanna to be really careful about the display up here. So something that can be easy to mix up. We're going up in 
our resistive value as we're going up on this block of resistors. So we're starting out at roughly 68.9 ohms. Then as I move up, now we have a K. Okay, so our units of measurement have changed. So even though we're going up in value, we see a smaller number, we have that K there. That K is telling us you need to take this value and times it by a thousand and that's what your real value is. Otherwise your screen would be like super crazy. K thousand, so 0.985 times a thousand means we move that decimal place over three by three, right? One, two, three. So our real value is 984 ohms. Okay, we still have K ohms, but now it says 98.3. Excuse me, that's really reading 98,400 ohms right there. And then lastly, we should have an M. M is for mega as opposed to milli. A lowercase m and an uppercase m, we gotta be looking out for or else we can really be off in our numbers. But it says 1.044 m ohms. That means 1,043,000 ohms. This orange button we can use to cycle. So next up is like continuity. And we can see here, continuity is great for discerning who's who. Okay, so that tells me this red wire goes to this terminal block. And then this black wire goes to this one. And they're not shorted together. And we can cycle through one more time. Now we have diode. So this diode, it might be hard to see, but there's a white line on the right side of this diode. I'm gonna test this diode in both directions. So that there is showing me the voltage drop across this diode. And it's measuring 520 millivolts of voltage drop or 0 0.520 volts of voltage drop. And then we'll always test it in the other direction as well. And we should continue to see that OL symbol. And OL is gonna stand for open loop or out of limits. Basically, it means that this diode has no backflow, and that it's testing good. Next up here, we have capacitance. I've got two different capacitors that we can measure here. Um, one's for like HVAC. This is a run capacitor, not a start capacitor. So even though it's big and scary looking, the actual amount of capacitance here is very small. It's only rated for 30 at the high end 35 microfarads, which is not a lot if you consider that this is rated for uh, 680 microfarads. Then you might be wondering, well, why are they built so differently? This uh, capacitor here can is rated for 440 volts AC, so it can handle an insane amount of voltage. This one can only handle, I think it's like, six, yeah, this one's only rated for up to 16 volts, okay? So very different, but we'll go through testing both of them. Here on our little uh, capacitor for the house, for the AC unit, we've got three terminals. We've got a C for common, not for cookie, fan, and herm for hermetically sealed. So the common, this to here is one capacitor and this to here is another capacitor. They share this common terminal which makes it really easy for testing. Make sure your capacitor is discharged, you know, short it out or whatever. That's for not only your safety, but for the meter as well, because the capacitor can back feed into the meter and barbecue it, and that's no fun. So we can take a measurement here, give it a minute to charge up, and that funky looking U on the screen is for micro. So it's saying, hey, there's five microfarads, and then we can go to our other terminal and there is our 35 microfarads. Now on this capacitor, there is a negative sign. So ideally we put the black lead to the negative sign. This guy here, give it a minute to charge up. Remember this one's rated for 680 microfarads. It's coming back at 651. And I believe for this one, it needs to be within like 10% of the rated value. Next up is current, and current can be a little bit tricky, but notice that it doesn't say it's rated for milliamps. It only has an A, which is indicating it's only rated for amps, and it has a solid and dashed line and a squiggly line, which means that it can read amps 
or perform current merge measurement for either things that are AC or DC. I'm sure in the manual, it has a very specific range and can let you know exactly what it's rated for. But let's just go ahead and explain how you would do a current measurement. So we can put it on there. Now what you're gonna do is you're gonna transfer over this red lead over to this 10 amp fused port. And it says 10 amp fused because it's trying to let you know that if you run any more than 10 amps of current while you're doing this measurement, that you are going to pop the fuse in the meter. Now Fluke has some really awesome fast acting fuses that are in their meter. They're kind of special and they're a little bit pricier than your normal fuses, but they will save your booty. Okay, so we're gonna need to make our current measurement in series of our circuit. So notice that we have an incomplete circuit and our light bulb is not lit, although there is voltage present. We're gonna use our meter leads because we've reconfigured the meter as such that our meter leads are a piece of jumper wire. So there's no difference between this jumper wire and our meter leads at this point in time. So with that being said, we have to be really careful with how we use our leads or we can pop our fuse or we can damage equipment. If there's voltage present here and I took a jumper wire and I crossed the terminals, that would create a short circuit, right? Well, it's gonna be the same exact concept with your meter leads in this configuration. If I just took my meter leads right now, put them right there, short circuit, boom, you're gonna pop the fuse in your meter. So we wanna be really cognizant of how we do measurements in this configuration. But if I put it in series with my circuit, as opposed to parallel, we've completed the circuit, the light bulb turns on, and then we're able to get a current measurement. We can press the hold button here, and then we can look at our current measurement. Okay, that light bulb's drawing about two amps DC. And then it looks like if we press the yellow button, we can go and do AC measurements. Remember, no more than 10 amps. And then we have frequency and duty cycle. Okay, that was really confusing and frustrating. <laughs> as far as the Hertz in duty cycle, if you're being confused on why you're not getting readings, it looks like it needs to be specific to AC Hertz and duty cycle. So the only way I was able to get it activated was with my signal generator. It wasn't able to read like a DC pulse width modulated which is like super handy and something that you would really expect if you saw this setting available on a meter. As far as I can tell, it is only for reading AC, which I think is really weird. I wish there was like a quick reference guide booklet should be present with your meter as well in the packaging. I think it's really weird that they would have this huge booklet in every different language, but it's just for safety stuff. If any of you have an idea of what I'm, I feel like I'm obviously missing something, um, but the only way I could bring this up was with a traditional sine wave. It wouldn't load with anything pulse width modulated. And even with that, if I offset the sine wave too, it was having trouble reading it. So I just thought that was really weird. But anyways, that is the Fluke 107. Let me know if you have any questions, comments, con or concerns down in the comment section, and I'll check you on the next one.